Well, we all have our, our burdens in life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, and now that we are officially into start time, it sounds right. like Mr. John Opgard of Opgard Meadery, of Tuckwilla, Washington, not Tom Water, because we discussed right. that already. Um, right. One of yours is human mead. So, um, I'd say sucks to be you, but I think I want to drink it, so. Yeah, Yay. well, next, next time I make some, I'll save you a bottle. Yay, thank you. <laughs> um, so we are here basically, y'all, for question and answer. Um, and Marissa and John and I will throw questions in there, um, as in I'll just start asking him questions. But I imagine that given we have something like 15 participants now, one of them is me, um, I bet you guys have questions. So start throwing them in that chat for us, please. Oh, look, we've got one already. Um, that's a tricky one to answer without getting a lot more detail on that specific batch. Uh, there's a lot of variables that are tricky to control, and it might not have anything to do with scaling up specifically. It could just be something went wrong with that specific batch. Um, oh, let's see. Let me think on that for a split second. Um, if it stalled early, it honestly probably had nothing to do with the fact that it was a scaled up version of a one gallon batch, because if you do everything linear, like you said, you should get similar ish results. Um, my, my guess would be is that there was maybe a problem with the yeast, uh, a lack of nutrients, uh, with a, with a five gallon batch, you do tend to have a little bit more heat generated. Uh, so if you were making it in a, in a kind of warmer environment, you might have just tickled the, uh, the top of the range for that yeast and decided to quit. Um, in, in a five gallon batch, it's, it's normal to see three, four, five degrees of heat generated for it. So if the, if the temperature in the room is 65 degrees, your, your mead might actually be 70. Where in a one gallon batch, you don't usually see a whole lot of temperature increase uh, from the yeast activity. So that's the only thing I could think of that might change going from one gallon to five gallon. But again, that's kind of a minor thing. So I'd, I'd be willing to bet there was, there was an issue with, with the yeast or, or, or something to do all, along those lines. Um, it's, it's really important to use nutrients every time you make a batch of mead. Honey is short in nitrogen, so that helps a lot. Um, so if you're not doing that, make sure you're using nutrients. Um, and you can always repitch the same yeast again or a... Uh, maybe a, 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 a yeast with a higher tolerance for, you know, ABV or pH. And sometimes you can get a second yeast culture to take off and finish it off. So if you still have that five gallon sitting there, you might, might give that a shot. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, find me on the internet and shoot me an email and we'll go through all of the details of the batch. And then that way we can actually figure it out because this, this might be kind of hard to hash out here right now. Totally. So uh, the appropriate temperature range is going to depend mostly on what kind of yeast you're using. Uh, and a good really generic tip for making mead is to ferment on the bottom of the stated temperature range. So if the yeast says it's good for, I don't know, 60 to 80 degrees, shoot for 60. That's, that's kind of the ideal uh, for most meads. There's very, very few exceptions to that. Um, and so that's, that's what I would do as far as what temperature to hit. And in order to keep it at that temperature, um, I mean, there's all sorts of way to cool down a room. Um, I've, I've definitely done the laundry basket uh, with a little bit of water inside of it and throw some frozen ice bottles in it in the middle of summer in my living room, you know, to keep a batch of mead cool. And then you just kind of cycle out the floating frozen water bottles every six or 12 hours to keep the temperature down. And that is the most redneck way to lower the temperature of a batch of mead in the summer, but it works brilliantly and you've only got to do it for a couple of weeks. Um, because the, that is one of the biggest mistakes a lot of new mead, mead makers make is they disregard uh, how important it is to keep the temperature cool for most kinds of mead. So a little bit of rednecking will make your mead so much better and it'll, it'll take away a lot of the aging time that people think uh, mead requires. Awesome. So seeing as that's one of the first mistakes that newbies make, let's go all the way back to another question, which was tips for first timers. Yeah. Okay. So that one, the temperature thing is huge. Um, nutrients tends to be very, very important for mead. 
uh, honey is lacking in nitrogen. So it's much more important, I think, for most kinds of meat to have yeast nutrients added during the ferment uh, than, than any other kind of alcohol you make. Um, they're, they're cheap. It's, it's, they're easy to find. Practically any of the major brands work great. It's not, I don't even really have like a, a specific tip on what kind of yeast nutrients to use because they all work. You just need to add some nitrogen to make those yeast happy. Um, so that's the other big mistake people make is they don't use nutrients because it's a little, it's a little scary and overwhelming. You know, you just want to do honey water and yeast your first time to keep it easy. But if you just put a little bit of nutrients in, it'll make all the difference. Uh, and then the third thing I see a lot of people making a mistake on uh, is a lot of online instructions will tell you to boil the honey. Don't do that. Uh, if you want to warm it up a little bit to make it easier to dissolve into water, that's great. Uh, but if you boil the honey beforehand, you, you tend to remove a lot of the, the esters, a lot of the flavors um, that make that particular honey great. Uh, and it doesn't really improve anything in the process. Um, you know, in, in beer and, and other kinds of alcohol making, it's so important. But with mead, you don't need to boil the honey. And if you do, you, you cause more problems than you solve. So don't do that. So uh, don't boil the honey, use nutrients, and try to keep it cool, you know, on the bottom end of whatever that yeast you're using temperature range. And you'll make fantastic mead more often than not. Okay, so now with nutrients, um, we have a question on Obviously, the part of the question was, where do you fall on them? You're in favor. Yeah. I've fixed that part up. Um, so do you stagger your nutrient additions? And if so, how? And you, you said you don't really have a brand loyalty, but do you have specific loyalties to things like Fermate O, Fermate K, uh, Diamonium Phosphate, things like that? Yeah, totally. So I like to keep things as simple as possible. Um, the problem with uh, DAP, diammonium phosphate, um, or Fermate K, which also has DAP in it, you got to be a little careful using it in the beginning of the ferment. That can actually harm the first stage of the yeast kind of doing their thing. And, and so I tend to avoid those ones. I started using Fermate O uh, years ago and have just stuck to it. Uh, I found that it's got a much kind of, how do I say this in a nice way? It's kind of dummy proof. Uh, you can't, if you put a little bit too much in and the yeast don't process all of it or you put it in a little bit too late because you made a mistake, it's really rare that you're going to taste it in the final product. Where with DAP and Fermade K, which also has DAP in it, um, if there's any leftover that the yeast didn't process, you will absolutely taste it in the form of this real metallic sharpness that's not, that's not really great. Uh, so Fermade O is, is my brand. I, I use that um, in, in every mead that I do, that's been kind of my favorite one. Um, for a homebrew size batch, I mean, you can just follow their instructions on how much to use. I do stagger it. Um, I've done a lot of experiments, you know, side by side batches, trying to decide what the best way to stagger it is. And I found that I don't really get much of a difference as long as you get all of the nutrient in there uh, within the first four days. Um, that's That's been pretty much my go-to. So I'll, I'll usually do, uh, four total additions. I'll put in Fermate O on the very first day that I pitched my yeast. I'll put it on the second day, uh, third day, and then the fourth day. And I just split it up that way and it works great. I've never had any issues with it. And every time I try to deviate from that, I never really see any kind of improvement. Uh, so for, for that, yeah, just Fermate O. I don't use any kind of yeast energizers um, or um, I forget the other popular uh, uh, item out there that, that a lot of times you see kind of blanking, but, but Fermate O is really the only nutrient you use. Um, another one that is kind of in a, in a it, it's actually a similar product is GoFirm. Uh, you can find out there or, and, and GoFirm helps the yeast rehydrate. Uh, and if you just follow GoFirm's instructions for rehydrating the yeast, just do it exactly like they say it. Uh, you'll have a much, much stronger yeast colony going into your mead and that makes a huge difference as well. Uh, so if you see me using anything other than Fermate O, it'll be GoFirm. Um, but, uh, but that's, that's it. I don't use too many of the other products, but with that said, I have used the other products and they work fine too. Um, it's just Fermato is, is like I said, dummy proof. You're much less likely to have a problem with it. Okay, cool. So there's another question, but I'm going to lead into it because I've got a question related to it. So, um, milk me. This is a thing. It exists. <laughs> Let me about this. Because somebody wants to know if you've ever heard of or had one made with low pasteurized milk. 
Okay, um, so there's a bunch of variations of milkmead. Um, I haven't done many. I will admit that I don't have a ton of experience in that area. Um, I have tried to recreate, I'm gonna butcher the pronunciation on this, but there's a, there's a drink called blood that uh, supposedly was a drink uh, in, in old Norse times and old Viking times where people would ferment milk, um, like the leftover uh, after they've made cheese. And, uh, and, and the alcohol content only ends up being, you know, a half percent or maybe 1%, but it, it's, it's stable a lot longer than just having a jar of water. Uh, so it is safe to drink and it is technically calories, uh, but oh, holy crap, it's disgusting. It's really hard to drink. Uh, for fun, the only other one we've done is we took some pure almond milk uh, that a friend gave me and we added a little bit of honey so we could get it up to about 3% alcohol. And so we fermented almond milk and honey. And that was even worse than using cow's milk. Um, it was it was really funny, but but not enjoyable at all. Uh, I know that there are a lot of people that do some pretty cool variations on on milk and and also like like funky sour meads using using those bacteria. That's not really my area of expertise. Um, and and the ones that I've had, I don't really enjoy, so I'm not super keen on trying it again. <laughs> so, do you know of any that are commercially made that even if they're not your style? Are like considered to be technically excellent because I have a coworker that I should probably point at. Somewhere. I have never seen a single milk mead uh, for sale. So if there is one, I'm not aware of it. Um, and I've had a lot of commercial meads, so it could be that there's just maybe that's just a little bit too niche in a niche market sort of thing. Uh, to, to do it commercially, but uh, if anybody figures out how to make one and they think it's really fantastic, send me a bottle. I would, I'll totally try it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, this person has a batch bulk aging in a carboy. Sweet. Quote, should I wait until it's clear before bottling it or will it clear up in the bottles too? Unquote. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this is pretty heavily debated uh, in the mead world, in the homebrew world, because if you bottle it cloudy, it's not as aesthetically pleasing. Uh, and if it does clear in the bottle, it means it's going to leave a bunch of sediment in the bottom of it, um, which aesthetically is not necessarily pleasing either. Uh, there's a ton of people out there who will tell you that if there's a bunch of sediment in the bottom of the bottle, they don't care, and they'll happily drink it anyways. Um, but generally speaking, in most cases, a clear mead does taste better than a cloudy one. And that sediment doesn't necessarily add any great flavors. And when you pour the bottle, it's hard to avoid getting a lot of sediment in your glass. So I would suggest waiting until you bottle it. It's not absolutely necessary that you wait till it clears before it goes in the bottle, um, but it, you have a much better chance of ending up with a better product if you do. So I would suggest doing that. Waiting kind of sucks. Uh, I don't enjoy it at all. Uh, waiting for a mead to clear can take such a long time in a carboy, so we cheat. Um, there's a few clarifying products out there you can find. I've, I've measured a whole bunch of them against each other, and I found that um, Super Clear is the one that I like the most. It's a, it's a two-part thing. Follow the instructions. You don't have to do anything fancy with it. Just do it exactly how they say. It's only a few bucks for enough uh, to cover a five gallon batch. And most of the time it'll clear in a day or two, um, usually no more than a week. And then you're done and you don't have to wait. Um, I buy the raw ingredients by the gallon for my big batches of the meadery, but it's literally the same thing. Uh, it just speeds up the clarifying process so much. Uh, my normal turnaround time for a meat in my meadery is about six weeks um, before they're, they're in the bottle and ready to go for sale. And that's mostly because I use uh, Super Clear. To, to get them clear, um, even though I'm going to filter, that just speeds up the process so much. So get you some super clear and clear it and then bottle it and you'll just be, you'll be more happy with the outcome. Cool. Um, so I don't have another question from anybody else just yet, but I'm curious, what's Phew. your favorite honey to work with? Oh, is this really well, the one you use the most unless it is, but your favorite to work with? Yeah, well that, I mean, it kind of depends. Um, it depends on what I'm in the mood for, what kind of fruit I'm using. Um, I mean, the honeys will vary so much from one to the next, um, like the, the gal earlier was saying. Uh, so it, I don't know, it kind of depends, I guess, what I'm in the mood for. But I found, uh, I mean, meadow foam is 
is one of my favorites. I'm always in the mood for that. That stuff's delicious. It's hard to find a lot of it in bulk for a reasonable price. So we don't do a lot with it out of the meadery. Um, lately, I've been playing around with a lot of um, uh, macadamia nut honey uh, that I shipped here from Hawaii. Uh, and that, the, the honey itself just tastes like a butterscotch candy. And it's so good. It's like, if I'm going to put honey on toast, that's my favorite by far. In the mead, a lot of those flavors get lost before it makes it to its, its, its you know, final thing. Um, but it does still keep a lot of like the creaminess. And so any, any mead you want to have a little bit of that kind of creamy vibe to, uh, macadamia nut honey is wonderful. The only downside is it's a little tricky to get. Um, I don't know of anywhere in the States that, that sells it easily, but I'm sure if you dug around online, you could probably find, but we get it from uh, an apiary out in Hawaii and it's fantastic. So that, I guess that might be my favorite. Like gun to my head, I have to pick one. Macadamia nut honey is probably my favorite. Noted. <clears throat> well, that conveniently leads into the next question that showed up, which is from Ste, I think, I don't know. Um, <laughs> that, um, how do you get a nutty flavor into your mead? Um, Cause nuts have oil that might go rancid, um, but you might still want the almondy or walnutty or whatever flavors in a mead. How would you get that? Okay, so I suppose it depends exactly on what you're looking for. If you want like a peanut butter and jelly sort of thing, they do sell extracts out there uh, that dissolve into meat just fine. Um, I'm kind of blanking on the name, but uh, but if you look at like the extract companies, you can find PB2, I think is what it's called. I'm blanking on the name, but it's it tastes just like peanut butter. It's It's wild. So like if that's the kind of flavor you go, um, rather than trying to put peanuts in your mead, I suggest just getting, just cheating, getting the extract. It tastes exactly like peanut butter. Uh, I've had some peanut butter and jelly meads from a couple of meaderies across the country. There's one in Florida. I'm going to butcher the name, but Garrett, Garrett Hista, Garrett, something like that. Um, down in Florida, they make some peanut butter and jelly meads that are hilariously good, uh, because they taste just like peanut butter. If you want more of like an almondy sort of flavor, um, Hmm. I guess uh, a really cool way to do that is if you're, especially if you're using any kind of stone fruit, is to put the fruit in whole, leave the pits in there. Uh, cherries work, plums, um, peaches, anything with pits, make sure you cut into the fruit when you put it in there. So that way the mead can get in past the skin down to where the pit is. Um, but that pit will add this really cool sort of uh, almondy flavor that, that is really fantastic in a stone fruit mead. So that's a good way to do it. Um, as far as using actual nuts, uh, that's a thing that I don't have a lot of experience with. It's, it's really terrifying to me to sell a product that a lot of people might be allergic to. Uh, and when you use something that has nuts in it, um, the tank that touches it, the hoses, the filters, the, all of the equipment that comes into contact with that, you kind of have to worry about it possibly contaminating the next batch. Um, and I just don't want to make anybody sick or die, obviously. Uh, so as far as using actual nuts, I don't really have a lot of good advice on that because I just, I really haven't done it. Um, we, we avoid that in the meadery. Seems reasonable. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, related to flavor, um, somebody was given some vanilla beans. What are the best kinds of mead flavors to go to use with that? Or how do you add components like that for flavor, the best process? Yeah, okay, so um, I do have good advice about that one. <laughs> uh, vanilla beans are awesome in mead. Uh, there are so many different kinds of mead that would benefit from a little bit of vanilla. So this is kind of an easy one. Like it's practically everything is good with some vanilla. Uh, honey and vanilla just go together so wonderfully that that I, I, I would have a, an easier time listing off the meads that vanilla wouldn't taste good in. Um, fruit meads with a little bit of vanilla are amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, traditionals with a little bit of vanilla, amazing. Uh, barrel age stuff, you know, a lot of times whiskey barrel meads uh, already get a lot of vanilla because of the charred oak that's inside the barrel. Uh, so you get a lot of those vanilla flavors anyway. So using vanilla beans to kind of accentuate that is awesome and tastes amazing. Um, the trick to getting good vanilla bean flavor is to, to never use extracts. Um, I have never successfully used a vanilla extract and thought it tasted good. Uh, use the vanilla beans themselves. Um, all you really got to do is just kind of split them open lengthwise with a, with a knife or whatever, just to make sure the meat can get in there and, and get it all little bits and pieces of the vanilla pod really well. Um, but just throw them into the mead. Um, it is possible to overdo vanilla in a mead. So 
There's a cool trick that works with vanilla beans and a lot of other um, fruits or, or big heavy spices or hops. Uh, you put them in a bag and you, you just kind of let that bag steep into the mead and taste it frequently. And as soon as it tastes right, pull the bag out. Uh, if you just throw the vanilla beans in there or hops or, or a lot of those other ingredients, um, you usually have to rack the meat again, uh, which is just more work than necessary. Uh, so if you put them in a bag or something that you can just yank out and you can get cheesecloth bags at the grocery store or hop bags at a, at a homebrew shop easy enough. Um, that's a really good trick for vanilla beans because you can just soak them in there just long enough and then yank them. And then also keep in mind the flavor of vanilla does tend to fade pretty quickly. So if it's something that you want to age for a long period of time, like, you know, a year, two years, three years, uh, you might want to go a little bit overboard with the vanilla flavor. So that way when it fades down, you know, in a year or two, you still get a lot of it and it hasn't just faded into nothing. Uh, so don't be afraid to go just a touch too much on the vanilla if you're not going to drink it all right away. Awesome. So you just said that you don't, uh, you don't with the uh, vanilla extract. Do you use other extracts? And if so, when? Like, what are your opinions? It is pretty rare that I use extracts. Um, it is mostly just because it, it usually doesn't taste the same to me. Um, if, if I have yet to find a fruit extract for all of the common fruits that I use, blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, plums, all that stuff, uh, I, I have yet to find an extract that adds the same kind of flavor and the same depth of flavor. It seems like usually with extracts, you kind of get a sort of a one dimensional part of that fruit rather than the whole flavor. So I try to avoid them, but there's a few times when it's just too tempting not to. Um, like currently, nobody knows this, this is a secret, but uh, I'm making a raspberry cheesecake mead uh, that we're gonna be releasing pretty soon. And realistically, as a meadery, there's no legal way that I can get really great cheesecake flavor uh, without using an extract. So sometimes I'll cheat and I'll do that because it's just, it, it tastes delicious. Um, but as far as like the commonly used fruits, like my, my blackberry mead, I would never make a blackberry mead with blackberry extract because it won't taste right. It won't taste the same. And you just don't get the same level of, of flavor. So it's worth a little bit of extra uh, labor and cost <laughs> and volume loss to use the actual fruit most of the time. Uh, but that's not to say that extracts are bad. They have their place. Uh, it's just, it's rare that, that I want to go in that direction unless I'm looking for a flavor that I have no other way of achieving. Interesting. Just, um, I know that a lot of our homebrewers, at least, will tend to put the fruit and the extract in so that they get a little bit of both. Absolutely. Yeah. That as a homebrewer, I mean, that may, especially with fruits that are really expensive or hard to get a lot of. You know, there's, there's, there's those times where you go in the farmer's market, you can only get five pounds of something, uh, and, and it's just not going to add enough flavor to your five gallon batch of mead. And so using an extract to kind of boost that up a little bit is a, is a great way to do it. And that's way better than not having enough. So yeah, no, that's, that's a great trick. Um, but most of the time, chances are, if you can just find more of that fruit and, and you have a big enough vessel, because that's sometimes a problem as well, just stuffing all that fruit into a vessel. I mean, we've made you know, uh, I helped a homebrewer recently who's, who's in the list here somewhere. We made a strawberry mead uh, where we stuffed so many strawberries into this seven gallon or six gallon bucket uh, that, you know, we only ended up with about two gallons of mead or two and a half gallons of mead, something like that. So sometimes it kind of sucks. You, you can't fit as much as you want to put in there to get the right level of flavor. So that's a great way around that. Um, so they, they have their place, uh, but, but generally in the meadery, we have big enough tanks and I, and I usually use fruits that I can get access to enough of. Uh, so we, we avoid it most of the time. Okay. TK, first off, I want to say I haven't forgotten your question. I'm just going to come back to it because we continue to be kind of in this thread, but it's all about flavors. So real quick, um, on the same related, um, somebody wants to know about commercial purees. Any thoughts on using them in needs? And if so, when's the right time? Okay. So purees are almost always a bad idea. Uh, so the problem with a puree is it's, it's basically mush. So if you add, we'll just use uh, like raspberry, for example, you know, you're gonna put 100 or 10 pounds of raspberries into a batch. Um, when you go to rack off those raspberries, you can stick the hose down into the raspberries and get most of that liquid out. Uh, the problem with using puree 
is it will it will plug everything up. Um, you can't separate the solids from the liquid as well. So you'll get great flavor um, from a puree versus using that fruit whole. Uh, you know, like it, it ends up being the same, like it's not going to taste bad or anything. You're just going to have a, a much bigger loss at the end. Um, it's normal for the commercial meaderies that, you know, some fruits you just, the only way you can find them is in a puree. When they use a puree, they'll lose 40 to 50% of a batch just because of the, yeah, because of the puree. And there's just no great way to get that out, um, you know, without, without spending a, a ton of, of money on, on equipment or, or, you know, time that's just, you're just not going to get that much of it. So puree is not necessarily a bad idea if it's the only way you can get that flavor, but if it's a fairly commonly available fruit, just go get the whole fruit and put them in there. Um, you're, you're just going to have a much better yield that way. And, and meat is expensive. So when you're losing, you know, more than a third of a batch at the end of it, because you decided to use puree, it's just not worth the the slight bit of ease getting puree out of it out of a thing is is worth it's just not it's just not worth it okay it is true that means expensive so sticking yeah. with flavors we're going to go back to tk's question finally um he wants to know if you cook with your meats or anyone else's meats oh yeah totally um so i'm not really much of a cook myself um uh, i try but like it's not really my thing i do a lot of grilling a lot of barbecuing um so marinating meats uh, in, in acidic fruit meads, like, like a blackberry mead or something along those lines is fantastic because the acid helps the mead get into the meat and add that flavor. Uh, so marinating meats is awesome. Uh, I think my favorite little smokies I ever had, uh, I realized that I didn't have enough barbecue sauce to put into the crock pot. And so we just dumped in a bottle of blackberry mead with the last little barbecue sauce we could get out of the, out of the bottle. And those are the best little smokies I've ever had in my whole life. They were fantastic um we've made uh like shredded pork tacos um and poured taco meat on them uh that was pretty good um you know it's uh we we do a bit of cooking with it i think that in in the grand scheme of things cooking with meat is probably never going to be really mainstream it's such an expensive product to pour into a dish um you know most people who use cooking wines you can get a you can get a bottle of cooking wine for a couple of bucks it's pretty rare you're going to find a bottle of mead for a couple of bucks. Uh, the, the stuff's just kind of expensive, so you don't see a ton of it out there, but there's a few cookbooks out there that have, that have, uh, uh, have dipped into this much, much more than I possibly could, because like I said, I don't, I'm not that good at cooking. I'm surrounded by amazing cooks and people with chef experience, uh, and so whenever I want fancy meals, I'm lucky enough that I can trade my mead for them, and they make them for me. Uh, but, uh, but it is, it is absolutely a thing like cooking with meat. You should totally play with it if you're interested in it at all. Cause you will, you, you'll get good results. Awesome. Good to know. Um, and then I have, so I don't actually know this word, so you might have to translate it. Any experience with bochettes and any oh, bochets. best cook the honey. Yeah. Okay. Totally. So a boche is when you take the honey before it goes into the mead and you cook it and it caramelizes it. Uh, and the result is you get a bunch of really cool marshmallow, uh, chocolate, caramel kind of flavors from the honey. It does tend to wipe out a lot of the flavors that were originally found in the honey. Um, so keep in mind that, you know, a, a lighter honey with a really subtle but but pleasant flavor might not be the best candidate for a boche because you're just going to wipe out what's, what's already there. Um, but yeah, boches... Bochets are tricky. Uh, it is really easy to overcook them. If you cook them too far, it's just going to taste like charcoal uh, and it's bitter and acrid and, and not super pleasant at all. Um, so the, the best way to do it, especially when you're first learning how to do a boche, is low and slow, uh, like, some, like some barbecue. Just take it real easy, keep it a fairly low temperature, and check it often. Um, there's a lot of people that like to do, uh, they like to caramelize honey in like a crock pot. You can get those inserts uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't stick to the outside of the crock pot and make it impossible to clean. Um, and, you know, it can take 6, 8, 10, 12 hours to do it, but just check it often. Uh, I've seen a lot of online directions advising that you go by the color, that when the color hits a certain, um, I don't know, uh, a darkness, that you know it's done, don't do that. Uh, every honey looks different when it starts. And so when it's caramelized to the perfect amount, 
it's going to be a different color depending on what kind of honey you use. So avoid any directions where they say, well, you just cook the honey for so long at a certain temperature to get to this color. Uh, it's not that consistent. You just literally have to be tasting it frequently uh, to, to see, you know, when it, when it gets to the point that it's going to get to, that it's good. Um, just look for those marshmallow caramel notes uh, in the honey when you taste it. If it starts to get bitter or acrid, it is time to stop because any further and you're, you're basically just going to ruin it and it's going to be, it's going to be hard to drink. Uh, so my, my best advice for doing a boche is low and slow. My other piece of advice uh, for doing a boche is there's a really cool way to cheat because cooking honey is a pain. Um, if you get it too hot, it expands many, many times its volume and goes everywhere. Uh, and, and what I've noticed is that that will happen if you look away from it. So you basically have to stare at this thing for 10 hours straight to make sure it doesn't explode and get everywhere. So what you do is rather than cook all of the honey for a batch of mead, just cook a little bit that you're going to use to then back sweeten the mead. Ferment regular honey, you know, maybe that particular kind of honey or another kind of honey, whatever, whatever you think sounds good. Um, and as soon as that's done, get your sweetness by adding that caramelized honey, because for a five gallon batch, you might only need a couple of pounds of caramelized honey, which is so much easier to do than 20. Uh, so try sweetening it. And then the other cool thing about back sweetening it versus putting in all the honey up front is you can control exactly how much of that bow honey uh, flavor you're adding to it. Um, if you if you start adding to it, it bouched honey or caramelized honey is very 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 rich. It takes a little tiny bit to make what tastes like a very sweet mead, and so if it starts to get to the point where you know I've, I've only added in half a pound and it doesn't have the sweetness level, but it's got a lot of flavor, you can add in another you know regular honey to kind of complement that. Um, you just you just have a lot more control over doing it that way rather than throwing 20 pounds into a bucket and crossing your fingers. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, okay, so given that, you're, you're kind of talking about planning. Let's go back to one. Um, someone asks, can you walk us through your process when you plan a new meat? How do you put together a recipe? And are you const consciously working on balance as you build the recipe? Or are you tasting and adjusting as you go? Okay, cool. Um, so I like this question because it is very, very different. The answer for this is different for a meat maker than it is probably for a wine or cider or beer maker. Uh, one of the cool upsides to making mead is you can tweak it and change it kind of indefinitely. At no point during the process do you have to be satisfied with what's in the bucket. You can keep messing with it. Um, so if I'm trying a new thing that I've never tried before, uh, I'll make my, my best guess as to how I think it's going to go. Um, I've made so many different kinds of meads with so many different kinds of fruit that I, I usually have a pretty good idea of where to start. But every once in a while, I totally screw that up and I put way too much of something or not nearly enough of something. Uh, and the cool thing about mead is it's so resistant to uh, infections, um, oxidation, that, you know, even if you're completely done, the meat is clear sitting in the bucket and you decide, you know what, I'm just not happy with this. You can rip the lid off the bucket and throw more fruit in. Um, or if the flavor of a, of a particular fruit or spice is just too much, you can just pour in some traditional mead to kind of dilute it. Uh, so you can constantly tweak it and change it that way. Uh, so most of the time that I'm trying to do a new flavor that I've never done before, I kind of just go for it. I don't do a lot of small, you know, one or five gallon batches um, to test before I do a big batch. I usually have a pretty good idea of, of what I want, and I just have to figure out how to get there. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not unusual for me to just dump a giant bag of raspberries into a 200 gallon batch of mead that has a flavor that I'm not used to. Uh, because I know that I can keep tweaking it until I get a product that I like. You can just keep changing it, adding things, diluting. Um, it's it's not hard to tweak it. So that's kind of how I usually approach it. I just kind of gung-ho go for it. And uh, if it turns out, you know, not quite how I expect, not a big deal. I can just make changes as I go. Uh, if you ask somebody in a brewery uh, about that, uh, that is much, much, much harder to do. You can't have a beer that's 90% of the way done and decide, you know what, this could just use a couple hundred pounds of raspberries and just dump them straight in there. You risk a lot of things going wrong if you do that. Where with mead, that's kind of standard procedure. <laughs> nice. I'm starting to see the appeal of making mead there, yeah. Right. Right. The only downside to making mead is how expensive honey is. <laughs> 
but yeah. the actual process is a lot easier and funner, I think, than making beer. There's so much work involved in making beer, where with mead, not a lot of work. <laughs> it's just expensive. Very. But it seems like it could be worth it. Totally. Certainly when I had somebody's human need over here. Um, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I don't think you guys actually added human. Um, anyway, so to go back to ingredients, um, there's a question that I'm going to expand on in case people don't know. Um, this is, do you have any thoughts on the um, Alcohol, Tobacco, Tax and Trade Bureau's regulation of ingredients, examples, pea flour and malt? <laughs> I have a lot of opinions about the TTB um, and how they regulate products. So one of the challenges we face as a meadery is that most of the rules that were made for us weren't really made for us. They were made for the grape wine industry. And the grape wine industry tends to do things uh, a very specific way. They don't use a lot more ingredients than, than just grapes. grapes. You know, you go to the grocery store and you look in the wine section, there's one tiny little area in the wine section that will include other spices or flavors or grapes. But the overwhelming majority of the grape wine industry is just grapes. Uh, which means that the rules that we have to follow don't necessarily line up with what we're doing. So almost everything most meaderies do is is kind of considered an, an other than standard sort of product. Like we we fall outside of of what they're expecting uh, and what fits within their their very carefully curated rules. Uh, so it is it's it can be pretty frustrating as a meadery there's so many ingredients we can't use uh we can't we can't use anything with grains you know for example um at all whatsoever and braggots are amazing um braggots are if you're not familiar with the term is basically a honey beer um and we can't make those uh we can't in most states you can't even work in conjunction with a brewery to produce one officially with both of your names on it um, it's it's really tricky. There's a lot of rules that you have to go by that don't necessarily fit because they weren't thinking about mead when they created those rules. So that's a thing we're all working on. Uh, it's been getting way better over the years. Um, the last few years, it is it is much much easier to get recipes approved by the by the TTB, which is something we have to do with almost every mead we make. Um, you know, it was it was only three, four, or five years ago that the, the word mead threw them off and, and they had no idea what it was we were trying to do. So it, it has gotten way better. I mean, I, I still remember in the early days getting recipes denied because I forgot to include what kind of grapes I put into my wine. And I had to carefully explain, I don't put grapes in my wine. That's not what it is. It is technically honey based. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and that was only a few short years ago. So it's gotten way better. I'm super optimistic about the future of that. Um, cause we are, we are, we have definitely been moving in a positive direction. Uh, but, but it is still pretty, um, restrictive, uh, what we're allowed to use. I mean, there's, there's just so many foods and spices that, that a brewery can use or a tea shop can put into their teas, or you can make into food that we know are a hundred percent safe to put into a mead. They just won't let us because it's not in the approved list of ingredients. Uh, so that's, that's no fun. Um, but, uh, but it's getting better. It's getting better. We're working on it as an industry. So we'll get there someday. So a follow-up question. Um, it is a professional kind of uh, situation, the interacting with the TTB. Um, but there's got to be something that consumers can do, at least indirectly, possibly directly. How could we as consumers help convince TTB to get their act together? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, hmm. I'm, I'm trying to think on the best people to, to annoy and to send emails and letters to, to bother about that sort of thing. Um, I imagine that there's probably some generic TTB emails um, that they accept, you know, letters from, from just everybody. Uh, I, I'm sure those things exist. I just can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, shooting, I mean, even from state to state, the rules are so ridiculous too. And a lot of times that inhibits us. So you, you can actually do the meat industry a huge favor just by shooting your local representatives an email, telling them to make it easier uh, for me to get into their state, to start in their state. 
um, just getting a meter reopened is such a huge obstacle that that's a big part of what's kind of held us back as an industry, uh, just trying to get going. I mean, there are, there are still states that have rules where you can't actually open a winery without having a vineyard. Uh, we don't make wine with grapes, so that doesn't really necessarily fit for us. Like there are there are meaderies out there that have planters, you know, behind their building with a couple of grapes growing in it to satisfy those requirements. So even just bugging your particular representatives where you live, shooting them an email, that stuff's usually pretty easy to Google, um, and just telling them to that, you know, the meat industry is growing. It's been growing rapidly for the last five years. It's trying to become a thing. And one of our biggest obstacles is just there's just no legislation for mead specifically. Uh, most states, I think something like 47 or 48 out of the 50, don't even recognize mead as its own thing. It just gets lumped into wine. Washington is one of the few states that does recognize mead as its own thing, and it has a couple of its own rules, uh, which is really cool. And even, even that made our lives a little bit easier. Uh, so I guess that's the best advice I have for that is just annoy annoy whoever works for the government you can get a hold of and tell them to make it easier that's that's my that's my tip fantastic okay so continuing with regulation um possibly you've already answered this but it wasn't super clear to me but what was the most unexpected stumbling block to go commercial with your meadery hmm unexpected um the demand actually was probably the most surprising uh, when we when we first started the meadery originally, it wasn't really supposed to be a full time gig. Uh, I was working full time as an auto mechanic. Uh, my dad, who was originally my partner, had a full time job at Microsoft. Uh, this was just kind of a hobby that outgrew our house, and logistically, it made more sense to start a little meadery. And we thought, you know, our our goal was if we could sell enough bottles to pay for the rent, we could have a free place to hang out and and share our mead with people and display our weird crap on the walls and that's really all we were shooting for um that was we we exceeded that goal essentially immediately um i quit my my full-time job to do just this only only two and a half three months after we opened the doors to the meadery uh, and i haven't i haven't had a job other than working for the meadery since um and the demand continues to increase i i increase my volume by about 50 60 percent every year for the last four years um and i still run on meat every year i have yet to make it a go a full year without having to close down the shop because we just literally ran out of product um and it's usually two or three times in a year that we just run out we just can't produce it fast enough uh, so there is a huge huge demand for it and the supply just can't really meet it because it's so hard to get up and going uh, so that's probably my my most unexpected obstacle was that there's a lot more people that want mead than I had originally anticipated. So it sounds like what we also need to do is go poke everybody who's not here today to write their representatives. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I get emails. Uh, we, we ship to about, what, 42, 43 states, I think. Um, and so there's a half dozen states that we can't ship to. And there's literally the only reason is is those states have laws in place prohibiting us from doing it. So uh, it's it's probably two three times a week that that somebody says, well, why can't I get your product? Why can't I find any meat in my state? And uh, and and literally my answer is to them, it's it's you just need to bug your representatives and just tell them, hey, get on this. <laughs> we want we want mead, and it's so hard to get. You're you're making it too tough for these guys to get their product out there. So it so feels definitely. like you're actually reading. I know you're not because I've seen you read, but it feels like you're reading the questions as they're coming in because you're I'm totally not. Perfect I'm totally not. The next one. I'm um, half. I'm half blind, and so uh, uh, I can't. I can't see the the words at all unless I get real close and squint. Uh, yeah, that's what so. it looks like. But it's just fantastic because all the things you just said. Um, the next question that makes sense um, is: um, Is distribution between states more difficult for mean need than for wine? Um, especially, yeah. you know, because a lot of people have limited distribution, as you were just referencing, is that specifically an issue with regulatory laws? So the reason why it's difficult for meaderies to distribute cross state lines um, isn't just because, I mean, it's kind of all based in, in regulatory nonsense, um, but there's also a problem with wholesaling mead that most kinds of other alcohols don't have. Mead is extremely expensive to produce. 
Uh, so the markup from what it costs me to make a bottle versus what I can sell it for uh, is a much, much smaller percentage than with a bottle of beer or cider or grape wine. Uh, and so we have this kind of unique to us problem where if we wholesale a bottle to a distributor who has the ability to cover multiple states or across the country, we have to sell it to them uh, and, and make such a tiny profit that it's really hard to continue doing business without a massive volume. Uh, and since distributors, uh, they want to make their markup on a bottle because they want to stay in business, of course. Uh, in order for me to sell a bottle to a distributor that can take my product across the country cheap enough, uh, it's, it is really, really hard for us all to make our dollar so we can pay our bills. Uh, and so you don't see a ton of meteries distributing en masse because it's just really hard to make that kind of volume uh, in order for it to financially make sense. Uh, the one of the big reasons it's hard to make that much volume is honey, really good quality honey is, is really, really hard to get. Um, one of the biggest obstacles that any meadery runs into as they grow is trying to find enough quality honey. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I'm, I, I'm probably considered like a, a medium sized, small to medium sized meadery and the apiaries or the, the, the honey packers, the stores that I go into and I walk into, it's normal for me to just buy them out multiple times a year. And I'll take every bit of it that I possibly can and wipe them out, and and there's and that's still not enough. Um, so making enough volume that you can sell wholesale to a distributor who can then take your product across state lines is is just tough. It's just it's a it's an obstacle that that most cider and beer and grape wine uh, producers just don't have to deal with. Um, they just get a little bit bigger markup on their product because it's so cheap to produce in comparison. That makes sense. Yeah. So we've still got two questions in the chat that I'm going to bring to you. Um, but I'm going to pause before that and ask a more logistical question. Okay. I'm pretty sure more questions are going to come, are going to be either come to people's brains or what have you. Yeah. Um, are you willing to take emails? Of course. Uh, so my email address real quick is opmeadery. Uh, dot com. You can find it if you just Google for our meadery as well. Um, and you can you can ask me any kind of questions on there. I'm a pretty open book when it comes to all this stuff. Uh, I love helping home brewers. That's a big part of how I've, I've tried to help build the industry is just getting more good meat out there and home brewers help a lot. Home brewers help a lot with that. Uh, so don't be afraid to ask home brewer questions. I don't have any secrets. If you want to know how I make a particular mead, uh, just ask me. I'll teach you how to do it. Uh, I got no problem with that at all. Uh, so just, yeah, fire, fire away. If, if after this, you have any questions, don't be afraid to reach out. Okay. Thank you so much on behalf of everybody. Now let's go with the last two questions, um, which are rather different from each other. Mm -hmm. The first one is, do you have any tips on using wild yeast? Best places to collect it, pitfalls to avoid in using it, anything else? Yeah, definitely. So wild yeast is really tricky because it's unpredictable. Um, you are technically just as likely to end up with something amazing as something horrible. Uh, the yeast will, will make or break or meat, make or break a mead and you are just crossing your fingers, hoping it works out. So the best, uh, tip that I ever got was actually from Eric up at a sear meadery up in Everett, Washington. Um, he told me this years and years and years ago, and it has made it so much easier to do wild yeast stuff. Um, I, I have found that I, I'm not. I will admit I don't understand fully the science behind it, but apples attract yeast that are brilliant for making mead. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll get some raw apple cider, either I'll make it myself from apples because they're everywhere here in Washington, um, or get some good raw apple cider and just leave the top off with some cheesecloth over it and try to attract wild yeast with some apple cider. If you get the, the, more, the more starters, uh, of uh, apple cider that you use to try to collect a good yeast, the better you're going to increase your chances. But let's say you line up five different jars of apple cider in five different places, you know, around your house or wherever you're at or outside or, or however you want to go about it. Um, after about a week, those things should start fermenting. Smell all of them. Whichever one smells the best, use that to inoculate your batch of mead. Pour that straight into your mead like you were adding yeast to it from a pack um, and feed it with nutrients like you would uh, if you're using a, a commercially cultivated yeast, and you will increase your chances of coming out with something good like a thousandfold. Um, there's going to be at least one or two of those jars of apple cider that just smells like it's already turning to vinegar, uh, and you can avoid those. 
Um, you know, you can keep them going if you want to make some apple cider vinegar, but results can be kind of hit or miss with that too. So be careful. Uh, but, uh, but if you, if you use a bunch of different starters and use apple cider, pick the one that smells the best. That's the best advice I got. Um, I haven't had a wild yeast batch of mead go bad in, in years because I followed those instructions knock on wood. Um, but, uh, that's, that's my best advice, but still feed them like you're doing a regular cult, uh, commercially cultivated yeast. Uh, they, they still want those nutrients just like any other one. So that's important. Awesome. And any pitfalls? Um, if, if you do that, you're going to increase your chances. Uh, but, but there's always the chance something's going to go wrong. That something's going to grow in there. You don't want, um, expect some sour flavors. Uh, if you see anything growing, if it smells gross, uh, you should just dump it. Um, there are things that you can ingest that will grow on, on a, especially on a, on a wild yeast uh, uh, mead that can harm you and make people sick. Uh, there's a, there's, I've seen a decent amount of device on the internet where they say if you just kind of skim off the top layer of whatever gross thing is growing and continue to drink the rest, you should probably be safe. That's terrible advice. Don't do that. If it seems like it's going wrong at all, don't risk it. Uh, you know, meat, meat is expensive and dumping out meat out the drain sucks. Uh, it hurts financially, but you don't want to die or get horribly sick uh, from it. You know, it's just, it's just not worth the risk. So I, I guess that's what I'd say is if it, if it feels like, you know what, I think I might've messed something up. It's safer to just dump it and start over. That makes a lot of sense. And what I actually ferment most of all, and I don't usually reveal this to lots of people at once, but my favorite thing to ferment is actually vinegar. Um, oh, cool. So sometimes you get that before you get the mother fully growing, and it's the yep. same exact thing. You're just like, everybody says you can do this, but I just Right, <laughs> right. It's just, it's, you, you might be fine if you drink it, but also you might be miserable for the next month in a hospital, and especially these days, you don't want to spend any time in hospitals if you can avoid it. Truth. Okay, so... What is one kind of mead that you have never made, but you really want to try? I assume try making is what that means, not just try drinking, but possibly both. Yeah, okay. Um, hmm. I'm a, I'm a pretty impulsive person, so if I come up with an idea for something, I will usually go to great lengths to accomplish that immediately. If I think of a good mead that I've never done before, um, so man, the list of things that I want to do that I haven't are probably pretty short because as soon as I find out about a new ingredient, I just go for it. Um, hmm. I honestly can't think of one that I, I really, really, really want to try and have never done before. Um, or, or done some variation of. Mm -hmm. I got nothing. Okay. Well, then it gives of. us time to get one more of the last. They, we got two more questions in there. We got five, four minutes left in here. So I guess we have question tip uh, time for one more of those two, probably. Um, any tips on using oak for homebrew batches? Most of the white advice on using oak is very wine centric. Yeah, okay. So uh, oak is one of those things where you want to check it frequently, taste it constantly. If you over oak something, it's pretty hard to come back from that. Um, but the, the general rule of thumb that I tell people on, on, uh, on, on oak is chips are generally the least desirable, but they're the easiest to get. Uh, cubes are better than chips. Staves are better than cubes. And a barrel is better than all of those things. Uh, you can get small barrels for aging. It's a little tricky to find them, um, and it can be a little tricky to seal them sometimes, but it is worth the effort. Uh, with staves, cubes, and chips, you don't get the micro-oxidation of air traveling through the wood into the mead that you do with barrel aging. So barrel aging is the best way to add oak flavor, but it's not always practical. Uh, so if you're not going to go that route, um, staves are the next best thing. Um, I recently found these really cool staves called, um, they're honeycomb staves. Uh, Black Swan makes them. We have and them. They're really pretty looking. They are so they're pretty cool. Looking. 
and they, they basically just take a little chunk of wood and then they drill a whole bunch of holes into it so there's a lot of surface area so you get a lot of flavor from a tiny little piece of wood and they've got a ton of cool flavors you can get uh so if, if i was a home brewer and i wanted to add oak to something and using a barrel just it was just too risky i didn't i didn't want to do it or too expensive or too it takes up too much room that's the direction that I would go. I would get those black swan staves or really any staves if you can find them and they, and they look like they'll be good. That's my best advice for that. Um, chips tend to add a pretty one dimensional flavor. Um, you just, for, for a whole variety of reasons that I don't have enough time to go into, uh, they tend not to be as good. It doesn't mean they don't work. They can add some really cool flavors, but you'll get better depth of flavor from uh, every other form of oak commonly found for, for winemaking for sure. Okay, we got two minutes. Can you, okay. in two minutes, answer? What are your favorite commercial strains of yeast to work with? Okay, yeah, so that's not actually not too hard. Um, so I like Lalvin products a lot. I use a lot of uh, Lalvin dry yeast. 71B is a pretty popular one you see in, in the homebrew uh, uh, mead making world as well as the commercial world. I love 71B. It is really consistent. Uh, it tends to be fairly neutral. And it also eats up a little bit of, of the, uh, the acid found in fruits, unlike a lot of other yeasts. So if you're doing like a, a ton of raspberry in primary with 71B, the 71B will knock down a lot of that acidity uh, and you can make a much more balanced end product that doesn't have to be as sweet. Uh, so 71B is great. D21 is another really good one. Um, if you want to do some really cool wild stuff, find some Kavik yeast. Um, those are from the Scandinavian regions. Those are, those are a blast, especially in the summer, because the hotter you get those yeast, the happier they are. They are, are, are the opposite of most yeast, where you want to keep them cool. Kavik yeast love to get hot. We ferment Kavik yeast uh, meads over 100 degrees all the time, and it's, they come out fantastic. Uh, so that's my advice there. But I, I do really like pretty much everything Lalvin has to sell. And I'm not being paid by them to say that. I've, just, I've gotten really good results from basically everything that they do. Uh, so that's that's my advice there. Okay. Did I do it? Has it been more than two minutes? We have just enough time to say goodbye. And cool. et cetera. Anyway, we actually really appreciate you coming and doing this with us. Um, I think I told you, but for people who don't know, Jesse, who's coming on next from Mac Meat Hall, is the one who recommended we come um, ask you. And uh, I'm super grateful both that he suggested that and that you're answering this because this has been so much help um even for somebody like me who doesn't do as much mead um so thank you very much and uh yeah sweet thank you so much for for having me on like this is a blast i love doing this kind of stuff feel free anybody listening to, to hit me up if you have any mead making questions that goes for you too just bug me awesome. uh, if, you, if you happen to be anywhere uh near uh mcminnville go to the mac mead hall because that place is awesome uh, I, I can't recommend it enough. And, and Gio and, and, and Jesse and all those guys that work there uh, and, and run the place are so freaking cool. So like it's totally so worth hitting up that spot for sure. If you're anywhere near you know, Northern Oregon, just make the road trip. It's worth it.